So this webinar is one of a series uh, which are a precursor to a new event which we are launching later this year. Uh, it's called the Urban Living Festival and it will be taking place at Tobacco Dock in London <coughs> uh, on November the 25th and the 26th. Um, we were very heartened by uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson's announcement last week that conferences and events can kick off again from October the 1st. Um, it would be great to see loads of you there in person because um, just before the lockdown started we hosted a couple of awards ceremonies which uh, I know at least one of our speakers were at. They were great and that feels like the last time uh, we were at an industry get together so we're looking forward to seeing a load of you uh, in November. Um, I think this is the seventh or the eighth um, of these sessions so far and we've had more than 2,000 people uh, register for these webinars since we launched the first one um, which is fantastic so thanks for your engagement everybody we, we really appreciate it. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping rules here um, we're going to chat for around 40 to 45 minutes with our panelists <clears throat> if you've got any questions you can use the chat function in Zoom uh, if you write your questions in there, then we will endeavour to get around to answering them uh, towards the end of the session. My name is George Sell. I'm the Editor-in-Chief here at IHM, International Hospitality Media. Um, we are an online publisher for the hospitality industry uh, and an events organiser. Uh, I've got a fantastic panel with me today. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves shortly, but just before we do, I just want to show a couple of slides to give this conversation uh, a little bit of context uh, and background. So we're talking about tech, we're talking about student housing, uh, built to rent service departments, uh, and, how, and how developers and operators are incorporating tech into their offer to improve it. So uh, just, I won't read all of these out, but just have a quick look at these and, and, and see some, um, some background there. So Samsung, who we have uh, on the call today uh, with Mataza, they, they are developing uh, internet of things ready, smart solutions for serviced residences with Ascot. Um, they're also very active in the student housing space, uh, as we'll hear. Um, there are a couple of interesting quotes here, one from Jonathan Gaines. Um, about a super high-tech multi-family building which he visited. Um, it was very efficient, but in his words, it lacked warmth, it lacked personality, and it lacked a sense of security. Um, so he thinks the human touch is, is a fundamental role which needs to balance uh, excellent technology. Um, so a couple of uh, other interesting quotes here. Students are using the latest technology long before they arrive at university. And this brings a level of expectation uh, that devices used for studying, entertainment or comfort will work. At the moment, new buildings are not being commissioned appropriately and they are having to be recommissioned to make them smart. Now, I'm sure that um, some of our panelists today may have uh, something to say on that because obviously not all student developments are alike, um, but I think, uh, in the past, this, this has been a problem. Um, another thing we'll go on to talk about uh, is the uh, energy saving potential for, for good technology. So how to, how to run buildings more efficiently and uh, more cheaply at the end of the day. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask each of our speakers in turn to introduce themselves, tell us a bit about themselves and their company and how they fit into to this discussion. So I'll go from uh, left to right as I can see you and uh, Fred, if you would like to kick off, please. Sure, hi, I'm Fred Lerker Lerkepool. Uh, I'm the CEO of Lavanda. Uh, we're a UK based prop tech company who's now, uh, our portfolio is global. We have about 12,000 units on our platform. Effectively, what we do is we create a revenue optimization layer over student, multifamily, built to rent, whatever kind of institutional asset. And we help place particularly short and medium term rentals uh, into those assets to increase the overall yield in different kind of use cases. Uh, so this is very much bang on the theme of convergence, which you were, you were talking about uh, earlier, this kind of blurring of different asset types. Um, and that toolkit can be used for uh, partners to either in-house it or we can help facilitate the operations as well in, 
uh, within the Alliance. Um, that's Thanks, Fred. Uh, Brian, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Welsh. I'm the Chief Executive of Nido Student. We're one of Europe's, uh, I guess, largest and fastest growing providers of purpose-built student accommodation. We operate up and down the value chain from uh, development services through investment, uh, raising financing, uh, mobilizing, stabilizing and, uh, and optimizing uh, student accommodation throughout Europe. Um, I've uh, been involved in the sector for 15 years and seen the growth of the sector in the UK and we're now uh, working hard to mirror that across Europe. Uh, we're active in Germany, the Netherlands, Portugal, Ireland and the UK at the moment and we're operating and mobilizing around about 12,000 beds. Thanks Brian. Uh, Mataza, over to you. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Taz Bakari. I am the General Manager for Strategic Accounts at Samsung. Uh, we have been active within the construction space for a fair amount of time and working with quite a few of your peers within the market. Uh, our focus uh, is on uh, device provision all the way from white goods to air conditioning to hot water to 5G to display uh, and in addition uh, sort of providing a, an encompassing solution for the construction industry that's where we focus on with a with an element of iot built in which uh, is becoming more and more important for people uh, how how they want to live great thanks and last but not least gina hi everyone uh, my name is gina i'm md of sales and marketing for ca ventures we are a global uh, developer and operator um, across a, a multitude of um, asset classes, including student accommodation, co-living, BTR, senior living, to name a few. Um, we're launching a brand new student accommodation platform in the UK. Um, 5th of August, I think is our date, so watch this space. Um, we're, we're launching three buildings, 927 beds in um, Glasgow, Sheffield and Edinburgh. So um, taking a bit of a different stance, more of a premium offering than other players. Much like Brian, I've been in the sector for, I think, 12 years now. So um, have seen it go from strength to strength and seen quite a lot of um, changes and trends evolve with, with customers. Great. Thanks, Gina. Um, if you would like to engage with any of our speakers on LinkedIn, you can see their profiles there in the chat. Uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to hear from you. So let's kick off. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk first about how technology is changing both the customer and the operator experience. And I think we probably better take those separately. So Gina, let, let's stick with you um, and look at the operator experience to, to start with. What have been the most significant advances in technology in the, uh, in the way that you guys run your buildings, not just in student uh, accommodation, but across the asset classes that you're active in? Yeah, sure. So um obviously there's a variety of different pillars that we look at and i think the first thing is is internally so with our staff and our training our systems how can we improve um just how we're operating so that it's far more efficient so one of the ways that we do that is spend a huge amount of time on our reporting and analytics suite which is um you know quite a unique selling point of of the ca way um if you like um we, we pull data into a centralized data repository and, and you know, have very, very um, comprehensive, detailed reports that allow us to really pinpoint um, how an asset is performing in a variety of, you know, ways. Um, we'll go into a bit more detail, I'm sure, throughout this conversation on sustainability, but that, again, all of that information gets pulled into a central resource. So that, for us, is um, really... Uh, kind of the biggest thing that we're doing at the moment. Um, we have internally got um, you know, a, a group of people together that are very focused on tech, our innovation team. Um, and they spend a lot of time looking at AI, looking at, I think, some of the bits where, you know, people can access our buildings themselves and self-serve for viewings, loads of different, different things like that. So certainly at the moment, it's very topical internally for us um, is, you know, assessing every piece of tech that we really can. Um, and then the consumer piece really for us is, probably the most important thing is accessing, you know, really looking at the customer, their customer journey, where their pain points are and what tech can help us automate some of those pain points and create efficiency efficiencies. Um, in particular, we know with students, um, 
that and, and with working professionals really everybody's extremely um, time sensitive and they want everything with some immediacy um, and a lot of our customers are international in different time zones it's not always easy to do that with people so we need to machine it we really need to think about um, how we can be delivering that service quicker and um, and faster and so we do spend a lot of time thinking about that customer journey from end to end um, and what tech can fit within that Thanks, Gina. Um, Brian, what would you say are the main technological advances that have enhanced your business in the, in the last few years? And, and what are you looking at perhaps going forward? Uh, well, listen, I mean, we're, we're a, a pretty tech focused business as are uh, the, the, the market we market towards are super tech savvy and way more so than, than those of us who are advancing in, in years for sure. And we, we need to bend with that. So one of our core underpinning values is around technology. Typically, we manage very large assets on relatively light staffing complements. So we need to make use of technology to, to, the, to the greatest advantage. If I remember the years to when I uh, first launched a student accommodation business as the general manager, um, we, we were, you know, there were 695 bedrooms. We printed out 695 copies of contracts times two, and then we snail mailed them all over the world and gave people a fortnight to return them. Now, that, that's the sort of thing that we can now do instantaneously online with e-signatures and everything else. So, so the administrative back of house activities have been, uh, have been game changing for what we do within the sector. And the removal of all that administrative burden has meant that people can be more proactive and they can be out there and they can be interacting with customers, creating great events and great experiences more, which from, is, is just a virtuous circle. It makes people more sticky. It creates a better environment. It allows us to help the young people on their journey and in, in fairness it allows us to support them in many other ways and uh, we, we all have, we, certainly in the UK we've been hearing more and more about the prevalence of, uh, of poor mental health amongst uh, amongst young people and we're, we're not um, we're not immune to that in the student world in fact it's quite a big focus of ours but if, if everybody was printing contracts and signing them and sending them all over the world that, that's all the time that they can now spend interacting with students which, which is huge and obviously right now with, uh, with the, the latest, uh, with the current pandemic uh, that we're living in, we've had to lean even further into our technology. So we already started doing virtual reality. We do a load more. We'd already started doing the odd Skype tour for somebody who couldn't attend the residence. Now almost everybody sees a Skype tour. Where um, at the moment we've deployed uh, 20, 20 vintage of assets have, um, have uh, door locks that you can unlock with your mobile phone because you kind of, you know, you, you might lose your key or your key card or your fob, but it's quite, it, it's far less uh, often that you lose your mobile phone. So we think that's definitely the way forward. We've, we've had huge engagement with our virtual events program. We've been running everything from yoga to um, virtual DJ sessions at the Nido student, uh, on the Nido, Nido student Instagram uh, site. So anybody who hasn't checked that out yet, by all means, check it out. It's free and we're, we're, we're sharing that with um, other organizations across Europe um, and we've, we've given, it, given access to that to a bunch of Italian students and a few thousand Italians on there as well enjoying uh, Nido Yoga in English. So a bunch of stuff we're doing, we're trialing, uh, we're doing a lot of development at the moment, uh, enhancing and including um, technology wherever we can. So we, we think there are huge opportunities in technology and, and more to come with uh, self-cleaning vacuum robots is one of the more out, out there ideas we're trying at the moment. But, Somebody, somebody like uh, Taz needs to make them be able to walk upstairs before I'd be really excited. <laughs> well, Taz, let, let's come to you. How has the um, how has the expected level of technology in a new build, uh, whether it's uh, um, PBSA or B two R, how has that changed in the last couple of years, and how do you envisage that going forward? In a couple of years? So, what, what, where, what's the level now? Uh, and how much has that come on in, in, in recent years? Oh, it's incredibly uh, sort of moved at an extremely fast pace. Uh, and we, we, will, we will continue to see a growth in how uh, innovation plays a part within buildings and how the residents want to interact with those buildings. We are, we are finding a great uh, sort of acceptance of that early adoption within this space. Now, I think with, with Samsung, the, the, the whole point uh, of, of our organization is innovation remains at the heart of what we do. Um, how can we make our customers' journey more meaningful? 
and you know it, it's it's taking the products that you take for granted like a washing machine and a dishwasher and an air conditioning unit and how do you make it more interesting within the building make it more efficient um you know we we, we all talk about iot and that's playing a massive part within buildings now uh, we are finding more and more adoption towards iot from uh, developers and construction organizations uh, and there are two facets to it of course there's a a consumer facet to it where it's a very interesting way of operating your devices whereby you can keep a complete control on what's happening within your house if there's a security measure there you, there's an energy efficiency measure there, which is uh, which is the consumer story, but the commercial story, uh, the way we see it, is, is quite different. It is really down to the fact that can we utilize smart technology to ensure preventative maintenance? Can we make a washing machine smart enough to tell you that it's going to go wrong before it goes wrong? Can a dryer tell you, look, I'm 50% at capacity or a compressor in a fridge tell you I'm X amount of capacity, things are going to go wrong. A lot of money, and, 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 and our colleagues on the call will all, all admit this, a lot of money is spent on maintenance. A lot of money is wasted on maintenance whereby people turn up with the wrong parts and sort of it's a, it's a bad customer experience. And I think IoT can fix that. It's, um, you know, majority of the focus for PBSA, of course, as well as PRS is focused on the millennials and Gen Z. And, and they really don't know life without the internet. So, you know, we are all connected, but our properties are not connected. And we're finding more and more of that becoming very important within, uh, within this sector. Mm -hmm. And in terms of physically incorporating this technology into new buildings, I'm presuming, um, you know, with the advent of super fast Wi-Fi and so on, it's easier than it used to be. I mean, there was a time in the early 2000s when um, you had to have the latest cabling and it became obsolete fairly quickly. But presumably the, the, the IoT um, ready um, installations are a lot easier and simpler than it would have been to recable a, a whole building to, to keep up to date. Yes, no doubt. We, the, the, the idea really is that how can we make devices sort of living and breathing? How, how can we have them sort of upgrade firmwares and what have you? And of course, connectivity becomes extremely important in that, you know, a good, great internet. And, that, and we're seeing a move to 5G now, uh, which is going to sort of help tremendously with developers not having to lay cabling, not having to do Cat5 cat cabling. So that would, be, that would be quite interesting to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Taz. Uh, I'd like to talk quickly about um, converging asset classes. A, a couple of things spring to mind that I've seen recently. Um, <clears throat> one has been a student project in Belfast, which is um, pretty much complete, I think, but the campus that it was designed to be built next to is two or three years behind schedule, I think. So they have changed um, their planning um, permission. So they're gonna use, I think, the top half of that building as an apart hotel um to, to cater for extended stay uh, guests and leisure guests rather rather than students um and i think and, and i've seen other other developments where um uh, pbsa developments which are used for students in term time and then as a part hotels in uh, in in, in, the, in the holidays um how does how can technology help i think fred you might be best place to answer this one how can technology help operators um, switch from one use to another within the same building or the same development? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, ultimately, uh, I hope this goes well because Levan's business model is, is contingent on it. So <laughs> the entire press of, you know, concept of convergence is really what, what we're interested in empowering. And I mean, one of the, for example, one of the things that we were, that triggered this was a number of years ago, we were in Germany and we were visiting a, a partner there and there was a huge uh, building where about a third of the asset was a hotel, a third of the asset was residential, but loads of Airbnb type accommodation was run. And a third of the asset was kind of co-living and there were three different companies running it. They had three different infrastructures, which were semi overlapping. So, uh, you know, imagine maintenance staff, hotel, uh, maintenance cleaning staff. They had three warehouses holding three different sets of linen. It was kind of a bit of a mess. And, and 
despite the fact the whole asset was owned by one underlying company, but obviously that was a fund and, and they weren't necessarily managing. So one of the things that we've seen is across all asset classes, there is a, a greater need for flexibility in, in our view than there was historically. And that can be because it might be a multifamily or built to rent asset that's come to market that might have a, a long lease up period. You know, you, if you bring a thousand units into the market, it's going to take you two years to, to fill that up. Uh, you might have other scenarios where voids increase. We're working with partners in the Middle East who currently have a high structural voids and that, that is likely to go for, for a number of years. You have student assets where typically these assets are, are fantastically positioned, like Oxford, Dublin, Edinburgh, or whatever. And during the summer, you know, often there isn't much of a use of it for the actual students. I totally accept there are some masters and all those things. But the underlying point is that planning rules to date and other things to do with that that are probably too complicated for this call have probably been too restrictive, or we believe certainly have been too restrictive. And one of the ways that we can drive efficiency in these buildings is by starting to uh, accept that each building has a primary use, but there are secondary and tertiary uses that are hugely important, especially if you're potentially looking at some of the more negative scenarios over the next couple of years in terms of recession, in terms of what happens in the PBSA market. You know, investors and operators need that flexibility to switch back and forth. So, for example, our toolkit allows that flexible switching between short, medium, and long term, dependent on the rental income at that specific time, and creates a toolkit around it that alleviates certain issues. So, you might have a team that, for example, is fantastic at long term events and meeting students and everything else. But how do they deal with 24 7 guest comms when you have an American family inquiring on a platform at three in the morning UK time? So, we wrap around things like short term revenue management. We have a we have a 365 24/7 guest comms uh, a business, and so we can plug those gaps that help the help the uh, facilitator the operator also bring in these kind of alternative high yielding use cases. And really, it's about that flexibility. So this this asset you mentioned Belfast, and there's, there's a lot going on in Ireland, Dublin, other areas. People are trying to play around a little bit right now, and some of that's in the, in the news. Um, they might need to do 20% of part hotels in the next year in order for council tax to get paid, but for, for frankly, the asset to be to be still running well and for investment to keep going into these asset classes and the whole machine to kind of keep ticking. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big thematic and I think it's, it's super interesting if we want to increase the returns of the assets, which ultimately will lead to more building, more assets and, and a better kind of development cycle. Thanks, Fred. Um, Brian, is um, secondary and tertiary uses of a building, as Fred put it, is that something that you consider across your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, we, we uh, of course, there are, there are many examples, uh, great examples of people using student buildings for other use classes. Um, and the, the, the Belfast one that you've, um, you've highlighted there is, is one of the, I guess, at the, at the front end of that. It's one of the first that we've seen is move from student to uh, notionally adding some more in a different use class. Um, and across the continent, we've seen different strategies employed. So the student hotel run by a, a friend of mine, Charlie, ha has been a successful business at uh, blending those two use classes together into one into one building, and they've done a, done some some great work. They've got some fantastic assets and fantastic locations, but um, there are some structural issues that you have with something like that. And um, one of those is valuations. It's it's difficult for valuers to understand and to to value the underlying cash flow. If they're valuing a student asset, they like to see 100% occupancy, 45 week or 50 week tenancies, and a, a steady um, NOI that they can uh, they can apply a yield to. When you start um, mixing in uh, short stays, even if it will be at higher revenue, there's a real balance to be struck that you can um, increase your revenue but decrease the valuation of your building quite easily by turning up the dial too far on short stay and turning it down too far on long stay, which is what the values are looking for in, in a student asset. So there, there's a real balance in that respect. And Fred, Fred and I have discussed this a couple of times as well. And there are issues around taxation, issues around planning that are gnarly and require, uh, require thought and planning to get through, uh, planning in the other sense. So, so um, for sure, and we do have, we do have multi-use buildings. We have blends of residential and student buildings, for example, in Germany, and we have some commercial use classes as well in our, in our portfolio there. Uh, and then in the Netherlands, we have um, on the other side, some uh, long-term campus style contracts with controlled rents and some blends of, of, of shorter state contracts in our buildings in the Netherlands. All of them can rub along quite nicely together, thank you very much, and we can put more and more sophisticated systems in place to deal with them. But the structural impediments are the ones that are imposed upon us by governments, and those are the, the, the toughest ones to navigate through. 
are you sensing that planners are catching up gradually or, or is there still a way to go in that respect? Um, like all things planning, it goes, it goes application by application, street by street. It's, it's, it's an old fashioned, uh, old fashioned uh, battle and an old fashioned industry. And maybe they're going to show some signs of, uh, of loosening things up pretty soon. Um, but uh, I'm skeptical. And then of course, all, like all things planning, they look forwards. They don't look back at existing portfolios. And in the 600,000 PBSA beds in the UK, um, whilst you might be able to make a difference to the 30,000 that might come out next year, uh, it's difficult to see how you roll that back over the existing 600,000 to, to make meaningful marginal changes in there. I mean, for significant changes. Yeah, okay. Um, um, I will, if I can, add to the conversation well, just that the tech piece around a flexible leasing really can't be forgotten. So what, what Fred's trying to do over at Lavanda you know, it's, it's fine to offer a breadth of different tenancies and different leasing structures, but it's, it's very difficult to actually manage that, the reporting and operationally have that sitting under one property management system um, because there are very different, um, you know, targets. There's very different ways of leasing them. So traditional property management system wouldn't have channel management, you know, in the middle of that. And that is kind of where there's a bit of a, you know, a break in, in how people are managing it, managing it from a technological standpoint, it, it does need quite a bit of work. It's very difficult for an operator at <clears> scale to, um, to kind of get that in place um, and not have, have to have staff trained on multiples of systems. So that's kind of what we work quite hard on in our platform is trying to really, you know, kind of stop our staff having to log into a million systems and train them on it and, you know, so it would be great if we had a solution for that. I know Fred's working quite hard on getting a system that can, can do both long-term and short-term leasing. Um, it's been many years coming, so that would be great for operators, certainly. And I'm in full agreement with Gina on that. She's been at the forefront of it, uh, bearing the, the, the slings and arrows that come with that. And, uh, and it's, it's been really tough. And uh, we have exactly the same problems. Yeah, okay. So Gina, you're about to launch a new student brand. Um, it, I think we can safely say it's interesting timing with what's uh, what's going on yeah. at the moment. I mean, you obviously couldn't have foreseen any of this. Mm. Um, we've read quite a bit about how um, the pandemic is going to affect um, education in the short and medium term. Um, more online learning, less face-to-face -face, um, uh, lectures and so on. Is that going to affect how you conceive and develop your buildings? I mean, student behavior is obviously going to change um, in the short to medium term, but is this going to have a long-term effect on, on the thinking behind how you um, build and operate your, your assets? Yeah, you know, I think time will tell. It's definitely something that a lot of developers are thinking about right now. Our product is already making a move in the direction of being a bit more about the individual living in the in the building. So example, I think I gave you guys earlier, is, you know, we have washer dryers in every single apartment. Students do not share a laundry. Uh, that kind of thing, I think we're gonna start seeing a little more of in terms of, um, you know, hygiene factors and just ease of living. Um, again, our, you know, our door entry system is a video door entry system. You don't see a lot of that in students. So it means those touch points about people actually having to, you know, come down and let people in, press buttons all of that stuff is, is really thought about. And I think just generally, there's been quite a move towards interior design and creating quite a safe haven in buildings for both working from home and BTR, but also study space is huge. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there'll be a huge, I mean, there's already a big focus, you know, student accommodations are ready to a very high standard, but I think we'll trend even more in the direction of interior design and making our amenities really beautiful spaces for students to, to use. Um, you know, when, when the product launches, um, you'll see some of our buildings. We have a lot of amenities, but they're all beautifully designed. And I think that's actually quite important because people are going to be spending a lot more time in those spaces. So w would you say the product is moving more towards a BTR model? Yeah, it's super interesting, actually, on the point of convergence. You know, there's a lot of students living in BTR buildings. Um, we do a lot of market tours and 
um, if you go to a MoDA or a, you know a, you know any of those buildings, there's a good percentage of students living in them. In fact, a lot of operators have to actually cap student numbers because you know it creates a whole new challenge when it comes to releasing every single year and, and apartments flooding the market. Your revenue management becomes quite tricky. So. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a bit of a, you know, as BTR evolves and becomes more um, commonplace, I think there's going to be quite a lot of competition created, additional competition for student accommodation. And you'd need to think quite carefully as an operator, a developer building, you know, a site where you might have BTR and PBSA on that same site, how those service offerings um, compete against each other, both on price and, and offering. I think that's going to become um, quite a bit more of a trend. Um, that we see in the market. Mm -hmm. Brian, does that tally with your experience? Yeah, it, it certainly does. I mean, uh, again, going back in time, people didn't want student accommodation being built next to them because they had this picture of students, you know, partying too hard, playing loud music, exhibiting generally antisocial behaviour. What we've seen in the last, yeah, the last decade or so is students trending far away from that. So student, the, the sort of antisocial behaviour element of students happening in very, very small pockets, and we're seeing far more students spending far more time studying, going to university, picking up languages, going to the gym, eating healthily, less alcohol consumption. So a, a big focus on well-being has been a huge, um, and, and, and community and society at large, we've seen from this Generation Z of students coming through. So certainly from being the, the antisocial ones you don't necessarily want to live with, they've become the, the, the model neighbours or the model tenants in a lot of the areas we've gone into. And, and of course, we've gone into, in some cases, um, urban, large scale urban regeneration projects. And we, we did a large one in North Acton, and we've done a lot in Dublin as well, where we've brought up neighbourhoods. And then we've the residential neighbourhoods with a big student block, and we're doing one in uh, Cork in Ireland at the moment, which is in a very residential setting. And again, um, that, that, that kind of brings the community along with it. So you, the, there's more porosity in the sites, there are more uh, interaction between the student body and the, and the neighbours as well. And we are starting to see more specific scenes come out with a two blocks of student, two blocks of resi uh, on the same location. And we, we refer to this as next generation living, where we're taking the old fashioned legacy rental project uh, product and trying to increase it, trying to make it more sophisticated, trying to deliver more technology, more branding, more marketing, better communal spaces and everything else. And the, the, they, therein you can create some really great synergies with the student businesses. So for sure we're seeing this convergence into blended living over time. But again, back to the fundamental thing, it's taking planners longer to get to that concept than it is the customers, the consumers and the, and the developers. Yeah, yeah. I, I was talking to um, Anna Barrett earlier this week and she's very keen on the concept of senior living and student living in the same development and, and how that can, can benefit both user groups, which is an interesting one. Um, Brian, while, uh, while I've got you, what are you guys thinking in terms of how the pandemic is going to affect your, your designs and operations? Is, is it going to be a, a short term thing or will it change what you do fundamentally? Um, well, great question. So the, I guess the prevailing market view and, and indeed our house view is that in September 21, um, we will be back to largely business as usual as a sector. So we expect um, 21 to be back to business as usual. So that, that's the kind of backdrop position. And then the question, the question goes, how do you get from here to September 2021? So right now, from a commercial perspective, lettings are standing up for September 2020. So they're broadly in line with where they were last year. For, so for, uh, as a sector, we seem to be so far, with lots of fingers crossed, relatively insulated from, from the fallout from the pandemic. Then the question comes, what structural adjustments can you make or do you need to make to safeguard staff and students and thirdly revenue oh, so first first staff and students secondly revenue so so then it's what uh, what um, adjustments do you make to your physical environments to safeguard people so we've done all of the things that you would expect to, to see with their uh, distance marking with their uh, antibacterial hand gel with additional training of staff and safeguarding and and um uh uh, shielding people who might be affected or might be in a shielded group. So we've done all of the things that our governments have advised and more and, and it's been really heartened by the, by the way staff and students have approached this whole problem together with a can-do attitude. Then we've kind of taken it to the next infrastructure level and said okay well let's put up reasonably looking per perspex screens at receptions so you're not um, 
the people aren't interacting directly over reception desks without some sort of barrier protection. But then the question comes in, do you make those permanent or do you make those temporary? Now we've spent the last, since I've been involved in the sector, we spent all that time moving away from permanent barriers between staff and students, where, where it used to be an old fashioned like GP surgery style layout and reception. We moved all that away, we installed standing desks and shorts or projectors and opportunities to stand at 90 degrees to somebody instead of at 180 and promote more interaction uh, between the groups. So I'm hopeful that we can get back to that. So what we've done is try to put in largely temporary measures that can be easily installed and demounted um, once we're through this particular phase. But who knows if there's a second surge or anything else, we need to be able to put them up again. So we're fortunate as a sector that we have predominantly ensuite rooms, predominantly no twin rooms. So people are generally in a room by themselves. Uh, there are studios in the sector if people are nervous about sharing kitchens. And, and we're, in a, we're in a market where universities are desperately, desperately, desperately keen for students to come. And if the students are going to universities, they need somewhere to live. So for a bunch of reasons, we've, we've ticked a bunch of boxes. Um, uh, hopefully there are no long-term negative uh, ramifications for the sector. What it has done is accelerated a move into, uh, into online and uh, technology. And from a head office perspective, for example, we're all working from home and have been since the beginning of the, of the pandemic, in the UK at least. And, uh, and it hasn't had any meaningful in, in impact on productivity, except stopped a bunch of people from committing an outreach way and adding pollution and everything else with it. So, so we're definitely evolving how we do work as a business, but in terms of the service and everything that the students experience, um, other than more students, I guess, being able to access some of the online stuff, uh, hopefully we can get back to every interaction with every student counting. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, one of the things that, that came up earlier was well-being and that's obviously something that the uh, pandemic has forced people to think about. Um, Taz, how do you think technology can aid operators in um, looking after the well-being of uh, both of their staff uh, and of their customers? Yeah, that's a very good question because technology has always been, it's been a double-edged sword, right? Because we've always seen that technology and a lot of research shows technology does make you fairly lonely. So um, I think uh, the, the, um, the way technology is designed into buildings, which allows open communication where people can sort of have a, an avenue to connect to the staff as well as connect to their peers becomes quite important. So, you know, of course, you know, you, you want to, you want to respect the privacy and you have GDPR issues in this, but <clears throat> technology should not be something that isolates you at all. Uh, one thing is also quite interesting is technology allows operators to also monitor in, and I use that word carefully, monitor the activity of, of, uh, you know, how if we take a student sort of, you know, how much are they interacting with the TV, how much are they interacting with their mobile phone, you know, using the door, etc. It, it, it allows you to track, should we say, in the well-being aspect of is this person okay? Are, are their usage levels dropping? Are they isolating themselves when they really don't need to be? you know the fact that can you track people in a way and i still of course i say i, I use these words very carefully um sort of track people in a way whereby you can tell are they joining gatherings are they doing those things uh, and and that allows you to then reach out to those people now technology is never i think somebody made a comment it is it, you know the human element is still very very important you need to have that. You need to ensure that people, and, and in essence, they are young adults. Are they looked after? You know, this is mainly the first time that they're away from home. You know, it can get really overwhelming. So technology can help, absolutely, but it doesn't take away the, um, the human aspect that is required. So we are working with uh, uh, some uh, student accommodation organizations. One of them, uh, they've put a couple of buildings in... Uh, in, in Sheffield and Colchester and, 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 and a few others uh, in, in other towns. And they're using Samsung um, uh, uh, TVs, uh, professional grade televisions, which allow sort of messages to be put on to, uh, to, to the room uh, and interact with the university. And that gives them enough information to see, is this 
is this resident actually interacting with the system or not? So, you know, it can, you can keep a sort of an eye in the, in the sort of gentler form. So technology, of course, can. Thanks, Tess. So um, I wanted to move on to sustainability and energy efficiency. Mm. And um, I've got a good question here from David King, um, who's probably put it better than I could. So I'm going to ask this. It's addressed to Gina and Brian. And David says, how important is energy saving technology to your organizations? If you were to prioritize that tech objective, how would it compare to one customer experience, two operational efficiencies, and three generally keeping up with trends? So uh, Gina, do you want to kick off with that one? Yeah, awesome question. I'm really passionate about energy efficiency. Um, and I've really raised it with our development team that obviously, you know, energy consumption is one of the biggest reasons there's so much um, carbon emissions globally um, there's only going to be one way that we're going to get that under control and that's if we make you know people more aware of of their consumption in student accommodation buildings at the moment different in btr of course um, rooms aren't individually metered uh, that's quite a big issue for me personally and something that um and our, our global sustainability chair so certainly something we were trying to um, implement in our buildings in the fullness of time because there's no way for us to implement any kind of fair usage policy operationally. There's no way for us to posit positively reinforce um, kind of students that are behaving well. You know, you can use all sorts of cool gamification to really get people engaged with rewards um, systems to do with it. So um, I'd love to see just that as just a, it's really basic. Thing. it's not I wouldn't even call that tech it should be a bare bones basic that I think every developer should be implementing to try and improve on um, energy you know efficiencies in their buildings in student accommodation yeah sorry Brian yeah go ahead sorry I was, I was just going to add to that Gina is of course absolutely right I mean uh, the thing about what we do with PBSA is these are typically large scale, super efficient, brand new uh, within the next 10 years, super insulated buildings that are, that are designed with sustainability in mind. And it's in everybody's interest because usually they are all inclusive of utilities. It's in everybody's interest to make them super sustainable. They're also pretty, they're also highly dense as well. So if you're an average student in an average 13 and a half square meter ensuite room, you will typically have some sort of panel heater on the wall and you'll typically not need to turn it on because your body heat within 15 to 20 minutes should heat that room. The panel heaters typically switch themselves off after half an hour or an hour at most. So, so, so heating is very small, a very small issue. Uh, or it, it's tough to manage it any more effectively than it already is. And then um, the small power appliances that you'll take to the university to plug in are generally a mobile phone, a laptop, a printer, whatever. They're generally a double A AA or triple A rated. So actual. <coughs> The actual consumption of energy, of energy in that sense for heating and for lighting is always, almost always LEDs now. Uh, small power appliances is very small usage. And then you're into water usage, which limits is, is, I mean, teenagers can use a lot of water in showers, in my experience, but it, there's a limit to how much they can actually use. And typically the, the, the sort of modern plant and the sustainable requirements that you have to put in to your modern development mean that most of the low hanging fruits are taken care of. So like, like Gina's saying, actually, I think the win is that we've got access to a load of young people who want to be sustainable. We want to be super sustainable. It's commercially in everybody's interest as well. And we're edu we're, what's all we're trying to do is help, help uh, nudge people along the journey by education, by we, we give everybody a Nido chili bottle, which is, um, you, 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 we, we, in most receptions, we put a, um, a drinking water fountain at the exit. And the intention is that you fill your bottle that we give you a Nido student chili bottle. And you can take that to university or wherever you're going. And instead of buying a water bottle or two during the day, you've got your recyclable chili bottle, which has cost you absolutely nothing. And uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're happy to throw them in to people who, who, who book the rooms. It's cost you nothing. You can walk around with it. You can keep it for a number of years. And you know, one student could save uh, sending uh, 300, 1,000 items to landfill just by using that sustainable chili bottle for a few years. And for chili bottle read, uh, coffee cups for life that we hand out, uh, we hand out hoodies occasionally and we're a big promotion around um, turning off the, the power and energy saving and run awareness initiatives as well. So I think that in the modern buildings, the moral of the story is they are already pretty efficient, if not super efficient compared with, you know, your, your three bedroom terrace house is probably, we, we could probably fit 60 students in the energy usage you've got in your three bedroom house. 
So it's super efficient. We need to make it more efficient, but what we really want to do is arm our students to be ambassadors for sustainability and get out there in the environment and spread the message. And that's, that's kind of, that's the approach we, we're taking as NIDA. And in, in some sections, in some conferences and such like in the sector, I know increasingly that's, that's the message. There's the, 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 the big gains have already been gained in the new developments and we're into marginal gains from there. So that, that's kind of our approach. But we're super, super passionate about it. So it, you say the big gains have already been won. So does that mean that um, you generate your own power for the developments using renewables? Do you have solar or ground source heat pumps or this, this kind of thing in the fabric of the building? We have where we can, um, but what we need, what we, so it, it's, if you think about the business as a long-term sustainable operation, like, like, like we do and like Gina does and, and most people in the sector, you, you don't mind spending another 100 or 200 grand of development phase because if you, if you save that back in the next three years, then the capital value of the asset goes up and it's a, it's a, it's a triple win. So, so we're, we're all for that. Where we do have uh, challenges, like again, I'm, I feel like I'm battering planners here, but I am. If I want to put a massive wind turbine on top of our residences, which I'd quite like to do, there's zero possibility of getting planning for that in an urban environment. So um, <clears throat> some of the, the real wins are just unfortunately close to us right now. And that, might, uh, that, that, that will hopefully change over time as people's, um, as people's uh, focus and people's, uh, people's um, priorities move around. Mm. Uh, and with the, with the direction of travel with sustainability, um, Gina, are you finding that securing investment for new projects is easier if you have high environmental standards? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That is something that is huge, you know, a very big deal with every single investor that we speak to. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not just environmental stuff, it's social change as well. And how, you know, how can we be creating social change? It's not just about the community in the building, but it's how can that community create, um, you know, social change around it and, and be a positive force. And all of that offsets, um, you know, a lot of the, the other bits that we're, we're putting into the environment at any given time. So we don't just look at sustainability as just being purely in, environmental, if you like. There's also a big social piece as well. And that, you know, starts from the moment that we, we take a piece of land and we start talking about a section 106, well, how can we offset some of that value um, by creating social change that triples the value um, that the council's expecting? So there's, there's a lot to do with that. I think young people today and, and our brand is certainly gonna drive a lot of social change using the people living in our building. They're just, they're dying um, to, to have an opportunity to get out there and create change, volunteer and take part in, in programs. It's quite difficult though for people to do that and, and know how to and understand what, what has the biggest impact. So as a, as a corporate business, um, we really want to be a facilitator in that and, and help our students um, you know, and our residents when we have BTR. Um, achieve quite a lot of good good in in the world um, with particular interest in their local area. Thanks, Gina. So we have a question here from Steve Lowy, which perhaps deviates slightly from technology, but there may be there may be a way that technology can can help here. Uh, Steve says, with so much of PBSA about socialising and sharing space, how have you or will you deal with a large outbreak of COVID in your properties? Um, and Russell. Ket has added to that and the consequent potential for legal action which may ensue. So um, <laughs> Gina do you want to do you want to kick off with that one? I'll be honest I think Brian's best place because he's living and breathing it at the very moment but I will say one thing and that is there's technology solution for absolutely everything you know there are beacons that you can put in your amenity area that will tell you who has been in there and all of our digital locks um, you know tell us who has accessed certain areas so if you're doing track and trace in your um, in your building properly, there would be a very easy way for you to establish who has been in contact with with each other. Um, but Brian's certainly living and breathing it at the moment, so it's probably best he answers it. Well, hopefully, I'm not breathing too much COVID uh, in at the moment. You know? Very good, very good. Yeah. So uh, I'm definitely living with the consequences right now. I can tell you. Uh, so listen, it's, it's a good question, Steve. Obviously, we you know we've performed a root and branch review of all of our operational assets and put in uh, put in the appropriate measures to secure them against uh, any, any possibility for transmission as best we can. So in the first instance, that's been about closing a lot of these social spaces and a lot of the gyms 
uh, while we establish the situation and uh, let the government's uh, initiatives and actions run their course. What we're, what we're moving on to is a more sophisticated approach where people will be able to reserve access to spaces, reserve access to gyms either in bubbles or by themselves, and common rooms exactly the same. Um, lecture theatres, lecture rooms we have, the small study rooms we have, the music rooms we have, all of the, the games rooms, all of these things, instead of maybe being six people in a games room, there might be one or maybe even two or a bubble or whatever else. So we're having to overlay in the next level of sophistication to manage traffic in those, in those key areas. But of course, fundamentally, we're a subset of the residential market. So we're grouped in with PRS and, and probably slightly better than co-living in terms of space, individual personal space available, slightly worse than PRS. Um, so we're affected by everybody else in the, in the, in the residential sector. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, Paz, have you seen an increase in demand for um, sort of temperature detection sensors, that kind of thing? I, I, my first trip up to London in several months, I, I walked into a, the lobby of a hotel and, and um, had my temperature read instantly by a device that I didn't have to stand particularly close to. Is this the kind of thing that we're going to see as standard in most buildings in the future? I, 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 would, I would think so until we, uh, we get some kind of vaccine and, and we can come out of this. But um, yeah, the idea is how do we, how do we save uh, or protect ourselves uh, in hotels and PR, uh, PRS and, and student accommodation? And how can we utilize technology to do the job? Um, so we are seeing quite a few tablets uh, utilizing thermometers, it sort of records whatever the data that you can provide at the end of the day. You can you can uh, do the track and trace um, as well. So uh, we will see more and more of this uh, coming in. But uh, you know we all we all live in hope that we don't have to sort of uh, have too much of this, and next year we can all return to normality. But the idea is how how can technology help um, sort of during the pandemic and uh, we're seeing a fair amount of that now. Great, thanks. Okay, so I'd like to round up by asking you, each of you in turn, what you think are the two ways in which technology will have the most profound effect on the asset classes that we're talking about uh, over the next five years. Um, Fred, let's kick off with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, assuming that the government kind of allows it, I think that the convergence between offices, retail, and uh, living will accelerate very, very quickly. I think you've already seen that commercial shops are now being rejigged so they can be redeveloped very swiftly. But I think uh, offices, I mean, I, I, you know, we all share networks with different people, but I know many, many people are, have surveyed their staff and a lot of people uh, are very excited to get back to work, but a lot of people are very excited about a different way of working. It might be one or two days in the office, not, not five days. Um, and equally, in uh, accommodation and, tra and travel, uh, different types are converging. Airbnb has launched a long-term platform now and is driving long-term demand, and long-term platforms are moving into some departments. So, Effectively, people are kind of learning new tricks, and I think it's that convergence between the different categories that is moving very, very quickly, and people could get caught out if they don't kind of adapt that flexibility, whether it's in the in the real world, the physical asset, or whether it's on, online in the acquisition or marketing. Thanks. Brian, over to you. Yeah, great question. I'll, I really want to say something like, floating space laser beds or, or something like this, but I think my, uh, yeah, you <laughs> Gina's probably heard that from me before, but I think my, um, I think my view is probably more mundane. I think it'll be the acceleration of an adaptation of a bunch of different technologies, um, things that uh, were kind of <clears throat> pushed, uh, we, we felt that sort of a, the, the, the irresistible force of nature pushing us in the direction of, in the direction of great use of technology uh, to socialize, to do video conferencing and, to maybe reduce the amount of time we spend on the road, um, and I, I think that's what's going to have a, a have a real difference as a as a you know as an organisation that's we're spanning across Europe. We spend all of our time flying from places on planes, trains, and automobiles, and being quite inefficient with the use of our time. Uh, I can see that uh, aspect of it, which is super unsustainable as well. I can see adjustments being made in quite a big way to that 
and us using more technology, more video, more effectively and more often. So I think, I think that's, that's a big part of it. And then from the, from, the B2C, from the customer side, definitely the online events programs have been super, super successful for us, way more successful than we thought they could have been. So I think really quickly we'll go from just doing an event at a residence, which can only meaningfully affect the people who live in that residence and the ones nearby. I think we'll increasingly be beaming those activities out to all the residences so more and more people can, can get involved and, and, and play the game. So there might too. Thanks, Brian. Taz, how about you? I think we, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, seeing how we can make things better. And the focus we've got within construction is very much about energy efficiency and sustainability. So looking at, we're working um, with um, uh, the Rubin Foundation. We've just done a deal uh, with them for uh, 6,000 homes by an organization called Utopia. And um, the, the, the focus there has been sustainability and energy efficiency using uh, air source heat pumps and hot water solutions. The, <clears throat> the view is how can we ensure that we, we uh, invest in technology uh, in the right way that makes the world a better place? How can we ensure that sort of we are reducing our reliance on fossil fuels? And this is where Samsung can help with sort of various amounts of technology which, uh, which allow uh, the construction companies to do that. Um, and in addition, of course, you know, how can we utilize smart um, uh, in, in, in regards to preventative maintenance and sort of reduction of waste and all those things. So the focus for Samsung in construction very much does remain on energy efficiency, uh, utilizing climate solutions. Um, you know, we've seen uh, uh, we've seen the Chancellor talk about green initiatives uh, last week, how that's going to play a key focus within construction and, and, and home builder market. Uh, we've seen sort of great incentives in regards to renewable heating incentives, etc. You know, there is a great focus to make the world a better place. And um, we, are, we are very keen to continue doing what we're doing in that space. Thanks, Taz. And finally, Gina. Um, don't know how I can top that list, guys. That was a good one. Um, I'd say just from a consumer's side of things, definitely the Internet of Things is becoming very important. Quite difficult to do as a developer because technology changes all the time. So it's quite difficult to actually build things into the spec of your building. Um, so those decisions need to be taken quite um, heavily, really. Um, but that is becoming more important. Something we focus on quite a lot over here is making sure that the, you know, the student or the resident can really make their space their own, controllable lighting, controllable sound, um, you know, door entry, video entry, that kind of thing, um, digital locks, all of that needs to be integrated into a single interface, which is an app on their phone. Um, so we spend quite a lot of time on that. Again, it comes down to the customer journey, but that we're finding is very, um, on trend at the moment and something people are asking us a lot more about. So definitely I'd say, I think we're gonna see quite a lot of very interesting homes in the future. Um, and I'm sure that maybe all the developers out there will, will have something more to say about it in two to three years from now. Great, thanks Fred, Brian, Taz, Gina. Thanks ever so much for your input. I think it's been a, a really interesting discussion. Um, the next in our webinar series takes place next week uh, and it's sponsored by a part book and it's about distribution uh, distribution disruption will the otas bounce back um, and that's being hosted by my colleague eloise at two o'clock next wednesday so try and join that one if you can um, as i mentioned earlier these Webinars are a precursor to the Urban Living Festival, which is taking place uh, in London in November at Tobacco Dock. Uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing loads of people uh, in person. Um, we've just confirmed a new supporting partner for the event, which is the Hoxton and Ennismore, which I'm sure many of you know, a very innovative uh, developer and operator, um, originally from here in London, but now operating uh, around the world. So great to have those guys on board. Uh, we've got a really strong supporting cast of sponsors and partners for the event. Um, and if you would like to get involved, 
then please do uh, get in touch with my colleague Katie whose details you can see there. Uh, <clears throat> we have recorded this session so everybody who's registered will uh, receive an email in the next couple of days uh, with the recording so um, all the details uh, and, and the discussion will be on there. We've got another webinar tomorrow which is part of our Engage series for the corporate travel buyer and provider sector uh, and this one very topically is called has video killed the meetings star um, I think the music reference might be lost on some of our younger attendees but uh, that promises to be a good one and that's at 11 o'clock tomorrow and that will be hosted by Mark Harris uh, there are the next three in this series we've got distribution uh, GDB and development um, and ESG um, they are all no doubt going to be fascinating sessions they've all got great cast of speakers so we hope some of you can join us there um, just leaves me to say again a big thank you to all our panelists thanks for joining us we really appreciate your uh, your input uh, thanks to all attendees for joining us and see you on another webinar soon take care everybody goodbye <laughs>